Hello, this is your addiction counseling skills bestie, Jen Ackerson, and today's lecture will focus on the topics of addicted thinking, maintenance, and recovery. It's my hope that you've gained a wealth of information so far throughout the course, and hopefully you've developed a deeper understanding of motivational interviewing concepts, as well as solution-focused and trauma-informed approaches, and recognize their efficacy in the context of addiction counseling. In today's discussion, we're going to take it a step farther by delving into the exploration of addictive thought patterns and cognitive therapies for addiction treatment. Our focus will be on the strategies to navigate and support individuals in enhancing coping skills, thereby contributing to an overall improvement in their recovery journey. A brief overview of addictive thought patterns includes the concept of relapse, and it's important to note that the misconception often arises when viewing relapse solely as the moment in time in which an individual engages with a mood-altering substance. In reality, emotional relapses and addictive thinking may manifest well before the actual substance use or re-engagement in addictive behavior even occurs. Addictive thinking serves as a trigger in the progression of a relapse dynamic. And addictive thinking refers to patterns of thoughts that are characteristic of individuals struggling with addiction. These cognitive patterns frequently play a role in sustaining addictive behaviors and may impede the recovery process. Common features of addictive thinking include denial, rationalization, minimization of consequences, and a preoccupation with obtaining and using substances despite negative outcomes. Essentially, addictive thinking involves distorted and self-destructive thoughts that reinforce the cycle of addiction. Recognizing and addressing these patterns is a crucial aspect of addiction counseling and recovering programs. We must be in tune with the special blend of addictive thoughts that each unique individual seems to carry with them and find ways to challenge that and allow coping skill opportunities so that individuals can dispute addictive thinking in order to sustain recovery. Transforming thought patterns involves substituting distorted thoughts with a more rational and logical thinking process. Distorted thoughts typically defy logic and overlook factual evidence. On the other hand, rational thoughts are grounded in reality and serve to reinforce, reinforce decisions to maintain sobriety. Nevertheless, as we've explored, ambivalence and resistance often stem from a distorted thought process. Nevertheless, as we've explored, ambivalence and resistance often stem from a distorted thought process. This also ties in with behaviors encompassing both high-risk behaviors linked to active addiction and healthy behaviors associated with one's recovery journey. Cognitive therapy can help prevent relapse and improve long-term recovery outcomes by addressing distortive thought patterns, promoting healthier coping mechanisms, and fostering a deeper understanding of the underlying beliefs and triggers associated with addictive behaviors. Through the identification and modification of maladaptive thinking, individuals undergoing CBT for addiction treatment can develop effective strategies to manage cravings, navigate challenging situations, and build resilience, ultimately contributing to sustained sobriety and an enhanced quality of life. Cognitive therapy, as applied to counseling individuals with addictions, encompasses several key co concepts integral to challenging distorted thinking. Central to this approach is identification of distorted thoughts, where individuals learn to recognize and acknowledge thought patterns contributing to addictive behaviors. A fundamental aspect of cognitive therapy involves actively engaging in cognitive restructuring, wherein distorted thoughts are systematically challenged and transformed to align with more rational and realistic thinking patterns. Additionally, the exploration of core beliefs is crucial, addressing deep-seated convictions that may underline distorted thinking and contribute to addictive tendencies. Mindfulness and heightened awareness play a vital role in encouraging individuals to be present in the moment and recognize triggers related to addictive behaviors. The development of coping strategies, problem-solving skills, and graded exposure to triggering situations further fortify the individual's ability to manage stress and cravings effectively. Relapse prevention strategies are also emphasized involving anticipation and preparation for situations that may be lead to disordered thinking and potential relapse. Self-monitoring is encouraged to foster a greater understanding of cognitive patterns and the establishment of collaborative therapeutic relationship provides a supportive environment for individuals to explore and challenge disordered thoughts without judgment. In sum, these integrated cognitive therapy concepts aim to assist individuals with addictions promoting the identification, challenging, and modification of distorted thinking patterns to foster a healthier cognitive process and support sustainable long-term recovery. 
The cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, pioneered by Aaron Beck, is a therapeutic approach that centers on the identification and modification of negative thought patterns and beliefs. At its core, CBT recognizes the intricate connection between thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. This collaborative method involves working with individuals to challenge distorted thinking and replace it with a more balanced and realistic perspective. Widely applied in the field of mental health, CBT proves effective in addressing a spectrum of issues including anxiety, depression, and addiction. The ultimate goal of CBT is to empower individuals with practical skills to manage and overcome specific challenges they may face. In contrast, Rational Emotive Behavioral Therapy, or REBT, developed by Albert Ellis, focuses on identifying and disputing irrational beliefs that contribute to emotional distress. This therapeutic approach underscores the profound influence of irrational thoughts on emotions and behaviors. Using the ABC model, or Activating Event, Beliefs, Consequences, REBT examines the interplay between events, beliefs, and reactions. Applicable to a wide range of emotional and behavioral issues, REBT aims to cultivate rational thinking and adaptive behaviors. The overarching objective is to help individuals develop resilience and psychological well-being by changing irrational beliefs and responses to life's challenges. Here, we're just going to imagine applying REBT. Um, So for instance, if, if I had a client who was struggling with alcohol addiction for several years, and despite periodic attempts at sobriety, they find themselves repeatedly falling back into old habits. In a counseling session using REBT, we would explore the underlying beliefs that contribute to this pattern. So during the session, the client recounts a recent relapse triggered by stress at work. The therapist uses the ABC model to break down the situation. A, for activating event, is the stressful situation at work. B for beliefs are the client's irrational thoughts like, I can't handle this pressure without drinking. And C for consequences involve the relapse and subsequent negative emotions, and maybe even potentially a loss of a job because of this. As the therapist, you'll guide the client through challenging these irrational beliefs by asking questions like, is it realistic to believe that the only way to cope with stress is through drinking? Together, you'll work on reframing these thoughts, replacing them with a more rational alternative such as, I can find healthier ways to cope with stress and drinking only makes the situation worse in the long run. So through the application of REBT, the client learns to recognize and dispute irrational beliefs, gaining tools to manage stress and cravings more effectively. The therapy process encourages the shift in perspective, empowering the client to develop healthier coping skills and break the cycle of addiction. So here are some examples of automatic thoughts. In the first example, the focus is on comparing oneself to others and arriving at the conclusion of being inferior and inadequate. This judgment is generally rooted in perceptions of lacking talent, attractiveness, charm, success, or intelligence compared to others. And it's important to tailor the language to suit an individual's unique experience as expressed in treatment. The overarching emotion tied to this situation is often a sense of inferiority. When automatic thoughts center around feeling inferior, individuals may respond either by striving to prove themselves or conversely by freezing and withdrawing completely. Understanding and addressing these automatic thoughts is crucial in guiding individuals towards healthier coping mechanisms and treatment. Consider another scenario where you tell yourself that you've been left alone, leading to feelings of loneliness and the belief that you're not receiving sufficient love and attention from others. It's important to note the distinction between physical solitude and emotional experience of loneliness. An individual can be surrounded by people and still grapple with loneliness. In this context, the automatic thought associated emotions are centered around loneliness. The challenge lies in helping individuals cultivate a sense of love and belonging. Exploring this within the framework of Maslow's hierarchy of needs during the recovery process prompts consideration of strategies to prevent feelings of loneliness and boredom. The focus becomes on supporting individuals in establishing connections, accessing a healthy recovery environment, and fostering a sense of being loved and valued. Another example of this would be when thoughts center around various forms of loss, such as romantic rejection, sadness, depression, or the death of a loved one. Grief may also encompass the failure to achieve a significant personal goal or a relapse with an associated negative consequence. In this context of change, loss is inevitable. All change is loss. And an individual 
individual's emotional response to loss plays a pivotal role in the recovery process. Feelings are linked to loss often include primary emotions like sadness and depression, which can potentially give rise to secondary emotions like anger. Observable manifestations of anger may include impulsive behavior and intermittent explosions. Severe depression might even hinder individuals from attending treatment. Understanding the impact of thoughts and emotions related to loss is crucial in determining behavioral responses. It becomes essential to assist individuals in gaining control over their thoughts and feelings while providing a safe space for the exploration of sadness and depression. Recognizing that individuals may reach a point of frustration with their emotional state, ongoing support is vital to facilitate expression and navigate the recovery journey effectively. And the fourth one that we'll talk about today is the scenario in which a client might believe that they deserve punishment due to feelings of guilt. And this guilt arises from either causing harm to someone or falling short of their own moral principles, possibly indicating a discrepancy in values and actions. The emotion associated with this situation is guilt, and it's crucial to distinguish between guilt and shame. Guilt entails acknowledging that you've done wrong, while shame revolves around the belief that you are inherently wrong or damaged. It becomes essential to discern between these emotions as individuals experiencing shame often perceive themselves as broken. Understanding this distinction is vital in addressing automatic thinking patterns and determining appropriate coping strategies, methods to dispute the thought, and behavior modification strategies to navigate these feelings effectively. If you're interested in what I'm about to share, know that there is so much more out there than this brief introduction I'm going to give you on each of the following. And there's just a whole lot more that I couldn't even fit on the slide. There are entire books devoted to this stuff, but here's just a few of the common thinking errors. So we'll start with all or nothing thinking. And this is also known as black and white thinking, and it involves viewing situations in extreme terms without recognizing a middle ground or nuances. Oftentimes when I have a client that has all or nothing thinking, we talk about opposite ends of poles or spectrums, and I try to get them to bridge the gap and find some space in between. So an example of this would be believing that any mistake makes you a total failure with no acknowledgement of partial success. And so the change process includes challenging this by identifying shades of gray in situations and acknowledging achievements along with setbacks and adopting a more balanced perspective. Overgeneralizing occurs when a single negative event is seen as a never-ending pattern of defeat. So the example is believing that just because one job interview went poorly, you'll fail at every future interview. So counter overgeneralization by examining evidence to the contrary and recognizing that isolated incidents do not define overall capabilities or outcomes. Filtering involves focusing solely on negative aspects of a situation while ignoring any of the positive elements. So dwelling on a single criticism despite receiving numerous compliments on a project. Develop awareness of both positive and negative aspects, fostering a more balanced and accurate perception of events. Catastrophizing entails anticipating the worst possible outcome without considering the more likely or positive alternatives. So an example is imagining that a minor mistake will lead to a total and complete irreversible failure. And so to challenge this, you would evaluate evidence for and against the feared outcome and consider a more realistic scenario. Personalizing involves taking undue responsibility for external events, attributing them to oneself without sufficient evidence. So assuming that a friend's bad mood is a result of something you did, even though there's no direct evidence linking them. So you would question personalization by considering alternative explanations for events and recognizing the limits of personal influence. So maybe your friend's just in a bad mood because they spilled coffee on their shirt this morning and it has absolutely nothing to do with you. Using should statements. So should statements involve having a rigid, unrealistic rule for oneself or others, leading to feelings of guilt or frustration when these expectations aren't met. Sometimes this is also linked with this idea of moral anger, where other people or yourself just isn't following a set of values or rules, and it can be can create a lot of anger. Believing that you should always excel at everything leads to disappointment when a mistake occurs. So to change this, you might replace should with more flexible language, understanding that imperfection is a natural part of the human experience. And the last one that we'll talk about today is magnifying and minimizing. So this is exaggerating or magnifying is exaggerating the importance of negative events while minimizing involves downplaying positive aspects. So magnifying, it might be like making a mountain out of a molehill. 
An example of this is magnifying a small mistake into a major failure or minimizing a significant accomplishment. So, you know, maybe it didn't do so great on your last assignment and you really sort of blow it out of proportion um, and then you minimize something that you did really well. So to change this, you would want to develop a more balanced perspective by objectively evaluating the significance of events and recognizing both strengths and weaknesses. And then as we move on to criminal thinking errors, now, as much as I hate this terminology and that it, I feel like it just perpetuates a stigma, this is what it's called. So this is the language I'm unfortunately going to use. And it's just very common that you're going to be working with individuals who have been in and out of incarceration. Most individuals who have been incarcerated and are seeking addiction counseling have experienced some sense of substance use in their history and have engaged in high-risk behaviors or potentially have sold mood-altering chemicals and have been in a criminal lifestyle. Criminal thinking thought errors are patterns of thinking that contribute to antisocial behavior and criminal actions. Identifying and addressing these thought errors is crucial in rehabilitation and intervention efforts. Some common criminal thinking thought errors include modification or minimization of offense. So it's downplaying the seriousness of criminal actions, making excuses, or minimizing the impact of one's behavior on their victims. So an example would be rationalizing theft by convincing oneself that the stolen item wasn't valuable or the victim could afford the loss. Denial of responsibility would be refusing to accept responsibility for criminal actions and attributing them to external factors beyond one's control. So claiming innocence or blaming others, even in the face of clear evidence or wrongdoing. Entitlement or grandiosity is believing that one is entitled to certain privileges or resources without considering societal norms or legal boundaries. There's just a sense of privilege or of being above the law or labeling wants as needs. So an example would be justifying theft or fraud because of a perceived right to possess what others have. Power orientation is seeking control and dominance over others, often through intimidation or aggression as a way of asserting authority, using force or coercion to achieve personal goals without regard for the well-being or rights of others. So again, these are just a few of many examples, and hopefully you can see how they're connected to the thinking errors that we discussed on the previous slide. The key here with thinking errors or criminal thinking is that the experience really is the teacher. When engaging in these ways of thinking or distorted thinking pathways, our brains get rewarded each time there's enough evidence to support a shred of truth. We can lean on confirmation bias and really get stuck in feeling like these distortions are reality. And this can be really dangerous, especially in substance use treatment setting, because these can all result in overconfidence where one starts to believe that they're invincible or unbeatable. And this can present itself in terms of a relapse, engaging in high risk people, places, and things with or without substance use. This type of thinking can quickly lead to overdose, death, and reincarceration. So this leads us to a discussion question for today. And I buried it towards the end so that you would have so much time to just suck this all in and really think about it. But as individuals go through the treatment process, they experience a wide array of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Sometimes individuals struggle to understand how their belief systems and thought patterns influence behaviors. For this discussion, select one thought distortion, and this can be addictive thinking or criminal thinking example, but how might you identify and challenge a thought distortion in a treatment session and apply any learned concepts or techniques accordingly? I want to hear what you have to say. Developing new thought patterns in cognitive therapy typically involves a structured process. While the specific steps can vary, a common framework includes identifying the distorted thoughts. So the first step is becoming aware and identifying distorted or negative thought patterns. And this involves recognizing thoughts that contribute to distress or maladaptive behaviors. An example of a distorted thought might be, I've been clean for a while now, so I can just handle one drink or one hit without any consequences. And I deserve to reward myself and it won't lead to a full-blown relapse. I've got this under control. Man, I wish I had a dollar for every time I heard that. This thought reflects minimization and rationalization, common cognitive distortions that individuals in recovery might experience. It underestimates the potential risks and downplays the impact that even a small relapse could have on the recovery process. After we identify, we then want to challenge our negative thoughts. So actively challenge and question the accuracy and validity of negative thoughts. Encourage individuals to consider alternative perspectives and evidence that contradicts their negative thinking. 
Then we move into cognitive restructuring. So engage in cognitive restructuring by replacing distorted thoughts with more balanced, rational, and positive alternatives. This step involves consciously reshaping thought patterns to promote healthier cognitive process. An example of a restructured thought might be, while I've made significant progress in my recovery, I recognize that staying clean is an ongoing commitment. It's essential for me to acknowledge the potential risks associated with using even small amounts of substances. I've worked so hard to build a sober and fulfilling life, and I will continue to prioritize my well-being. Instead of seeking temporary rewards through substances, I'll focus on healthy and sustainable ways to treat myself and celebrate my achievements. Isn't that beautiful? Next, we might step into some evidence-based thinking. So we'd encourage individuals to base their thoughts on objective evidence rather than assumptions or emotional reactions. And this involves evaluating the validity and reliability of the information supporting their thoughts. We'd also maybe want to try out some positive affirmations. So those are statements that can counteract negative thoughts. These affirmations help individuals cultivate a more positive and constructive mindset. An example of a positive affirmation might sound something like, I am resilient and each day brings new opportunities for growth and positive change. I choose sobriety and with each step, I'm reclaiming control over my life. My strength is greater than any challenge and I'm moving forward with confidence and determination. We might also suggest some mindfulness and present moment awareness. So we'd incorporate mindfulness techniques to enhance awareness of thoughts and feelings in the present moment. Mindfulness allows individuals to observe their thoughts without judgment and make intentional choices about how to respond. Reinforce the practice of new thought patterns through repetition. Consistent application helps solidify the development of more adaptive cognitive processes over time. You may also want to cultivate a focus on gratitude and positive aspects of life. Encourage individuals to intentionally shift their attention towards positive experiences and aspects of themselves, fostering a more optimistic outlook. And by systematically engaging in these steps, individuals undergoing cognitive therapy can develop and reinforce more effective and adaptive thought patterns, ultimately contributing to improved emotional well-being and more positive behaviors. Strengthening the commitment to change. This involves collaboratively exploring and reinforcing the reasons behind their decisions to break free from addictive behaviors. Cognitive therapy seeks to identify and challenge any ambivalence or resistance that may impede progress, promoting a deeper understanding of the beliefs and positive outcomes associated with sustained change. And this might happen through relationships, setting goals, evoking change talk, developing plans, and determining what is ready to be the next step. So by addressing and reshaping cognitive patterns, individuals can cultivate a more robust commitment to their recovery, empowering them to navigate challenges, manage cravings, and adopt healthier coping skills. This process involves aligning thoughts and beliefs with a desire for lasting change, ultimately enhancing the individual's resilience and determination to overcome the hurdles on the path to recovery. Thank you so much for taking some time to learn about some addictive thinking and maintenance and recovery. Let me know if you have any questions at all. I'm always so happy to hear from you.